Hey everybody, Trey here. Welcome back to another video. We have some severe weather back in the forecast for the Plains. It's been quite a while since the Plains have seen a legitimate severe weather threat, but we do have one coming up for Sunday, February 26th. The SPC has outlined an enhanced risk for parts of southern Kansas in through much of central to western Oklahoma into far northwest Texas. Places like Oklahoma City, Norman, Tulsa, Wichita, down toward Lawton, Fort Sill, Wichita Falls under the gun with this particular event with that large 15% slight risk area surrounding the enhanced. So it's been a while since we've had significant severe weather in the forecast for the Plains, but that is what is on tap for Sunday. Usually I like to wait for these um, medium range forecast videos until the day three outlook comes out when we have more of a uh, categorical outlook from the SPC. But since this is one of our, uh, since this is a severe weather threat for the plains, something we haven't really seen in a while, I uh, thought it would be appropriate to do one for today. We're gonna take a look at the current state of the atmosphere uh, at first, and then we'll look into some model data. We'll compare and contrast the NAM, GFS, and European models, and then look at some analogs at the end of the video that uh, this uh, upcoming setup has reminded me of. So let's go ahead and dive right in. This is the water vapor satellite imagery. A couple things you see right off the bat. Broad southwesterly flow across much of the country here, at least the western half to two-thirds of the country. This is a large long wave trough. You can somewhat see it in the uh, clouds there flowing from southwest to northeast. Very large long wave trough centered across the western half of the country and a piece of this trough is going to somewhat cut off from the flow, dig down to the south into the desert southwest and then eject into the plains and that's going to be our main player for Sunday. We'll take a look at some model data here in just a bit. One more thing you can see is this clockwise flow out here across the Gulf of Mexico, the Gulf coast states into Florida. That is a large ridge of high pressure and that is somewhat important for this upcoming setup. And we'll detail that in a, just a second. So let's go on to our 500 millibar map. As you can see, basically what we were talking about on the water vapor imagery, large, large trough here, broad southwesterly flow across much of the country. Some embedded short waves within this flow. You can see a jet streak here across the Midwest into the Great Lakes region. Short wave that was the impetus for yesterday's severe weather event across the plains into the Midwest. And then here is our secondary trough with this cutoff that is starting to form here across the Pacific Northwest. That is going to be our piece that will cut off from this trough, dig down into the Southwest and then eject into the plains for Sunday's severe weather event. You can also see the ridge down here into Florida, centered somewhere in that vicinity. That is our ridge that will be somewhat helpful in moisture return for this particular event. Again, we'll detail that in just a second. Let's go down to the surface, take a look at our surface pattern right now. We'll go into the actual surface data here in a second. Surface low up here in the Great Lakes, surface high down here into the Gulf of Mexico, and a very uh, noticeable cold air intrusion down here into the plains. If you live here in the southern to central to southern plains, yesterday we had temperatures in the 70s, today in Norman, uh, for example, temperatures in the 40s and low 50s. So we've had a cold front come through associated with this particular surface low up here that is moving into the Great Lakes. It is draped somewhere across here and we can take a look at our surface data. Let me refresh to get the most up-to-date data. And you can see exactly where that cold front is somewhere right in this vicinity. It's kind of off the map right now, but extends down into southern Texas. That's our cold front extends off to the north, meeting up with that surface low up in the Great Lakes. Northerly winds on the cool side of the front, south or southerly or southeasterly winds on the south side of the front. That is our cold front right now. But notice what's happening. We haven't really had the moisture scoured yet, and that is because of the track of the overall surface low, ejected pretty quickly off toward the northeast instead of moving off to the east. So the cold front just somewhat sitting there across the plains, uh, especially the southern portion of that cold front, not really doing a whole lot. Uh, usually, oftentimes in these cool season or off season setups, you'll see these cold fronts really intrude into the Gulf of Mexico, really sweep those dew points out. That's not going to be the case with this cold front. You'll notice we have 60s dew points all the way up into northeast Texas there, the I-20 I corridor, down through south central Texas, San Antonio, over to um, places like uh, Uvalde, down south of Del Rio and so even some 70s dew points in there 
Brownsville, 80 over 70 right now. So our moisture sitting sitting there across southeast Texas, and it's not going to move a whole lot over the next few days. And that is has to do with the track of the surface low off toward the north, just has that, that cold front draped to the south, not really moving a whole lot, not really as progressive. But it also has to do with this high pressure sitting across the Gulf. That has acting as somewhat of a block, if you will, or a wall. Oftentimes in these cool season setups, you'll have, um, you know, previous cold air or cold frontal intrusions well into the Gulf, sweeps the moisture way down south into the southern Gulf, and you have a difficult time getting that moisture up northward for severe weather setups in the southern plains in the winter months. Well, because that cold front, not super progressive, and we haven't had any cold air intrusions thanks to this high pressure ridge sitting out here across the Gulf of Mexico into the Florida vicinity, that is not allowing cold air intrusions to really make their way into the Gulf. So we're going to have this moisture sitting there across southeast Texas. It's not going to move a whole lot. Might do a little bit as this cold front moves through. Might move toward the Texas coast a little bit. But the point is it's not going to move. It's not going to be swept well into the Gulf, as is the case often with these cool season setups. So we're going to have a reservoir of these 60s dew points just sitting here across southeast Texas for the next few days. And then we'll start to see that easily be brought northward as we get that low level response as the upper trough moves in. We'll talk about that again in just a little bit. So interesting surface setup here. Moisture return still is a little bit of a question based on the timing of the actual trough ejection, but it's at least a step in the right direction for severe weather that we're not going to see these dew points swept into the Gulf over the next couple of days. They're just going to be sitting there as a reservoir of moisture ready to be pulled northward pretty easily for our upcoming event. Let's look at some soundings. We'll take a look at some 12Z morning soundings just to get an idea of, of that moist layer and that uh, area within that moist uh, that moisture pool there down in southeast Texas. This is the Brownsville, Texas 12Z sounding. And you will notice that the moist layer is quite shallow, really 71 over 69 at the surface and moisture really, really trails off as you go up right above the surface, up a couple kilometers there. Very strong inversion there at the surface. At Brownsville, some drier air aloft. That will all change as we go into the coming days. We'll get that more robust low-level response. We'll start to moisten the low levels, and we should see this change a little bit as we go into the next, as we go uh, approach our Sunday event. Now let's look at some soundings from last night out west. This is where we diagnose our elevated mix layer, or EML. We talk about it every video, it seems, on this channel, that elevated mix layer is that layer of very warm, dry, well-mixed air that originates at and just above the surface here in the desert southwest, west Texas into western Mexico. And as those southwesterly mid-level winds move in, it gets transported atop that moist layer in our severe weather target area. And that helps to, number one, allow instability to build. Uh, and number two, helps cap the atmosphere to uh, allow to prohibit storm development early in the day to really fully realize that um, intense um, environment uh, that for storms in the late afternoon hours for a given setup. We do have an elevated mixed layer in place. This is El Paso last uh, yesterday evening, 0Z sounding from the 23rd, so February 22nd, yesterday at um, in the evening. Look at that mixed layer there near the surface. Very strong inverted V profiles, dew point there at the surface at 28, very steep lapse rates here. You can even see what we call a super adiabatic layer. That means the uh, lapse rates in that li this little section there before it kinks up, up like that, that is a super adiabatic layer. That means the, there's been such intense surface heating that the lapse rates in that small layer have exceeded dry adiabatic, our dry adiabatic lapse rate, which is about 9.8 degrees Celsius per kilometer. So very, very strong lapse rates there in the, in the low levels, in this, especially within this entire layer. And that is pretty much the same that we're seeing across this region. We'll go into Western Mexico, even deeper elevated mix, even deeper mix layer there, extending up from the surface, dew point at 36 at the surface, dropping off very rapidly there at that station in Western Mexico. We go to Midland, much of the same thing, and Del Rio, very impressive uh, mix layer there, 93 over 23, very dry air, well mixed air, well mixed layer here. So this should give us some clues that we'll have some sort of elevated mixed layer transported across this region to help cap the atmosphere for much of the day on Sunday. Shouldn't be a problem getting that elevated mixed layer in to this particular, uh, to our particular target area for Sunday. So let's look at some model data now. This we're going to look as we always do with these medium range forecasts at three different models: the NAM, the GFS, 
and the Euro. The GFS, uh, let me get back to the um, 500 millibar map. The NAM is the 84 hour NAM. I don't like using the NAM at this range. It tends to be a little bit wonky and uh, just at first glance, uh, looking at some of this NAM data, it is a little bit wonky. We'll talk about that in a second. But our Euro, our Euro model data is going to come from our 6Z run, as that is the most recent run of the Euro. The 12Z run, unfortunately, not quite in yet. But still shouldn't be too many appreciable changes with the data from 6Z to 12Z. So we'll look at that 6Z Euro and the 12Z NAM and the 12Z GFS. So let's start with the NAM. Pretty good initialization here. Long wave trough centered across much of the country, a little short wave up here into the Midwest and Great Lakes region with that high pressure ridge built in across the Florida vicinity. So what's going to happen over the next couple of days, you'll, and you'll start to see right on the left side of the image here, this is our little closed contour up here. That is the piece that's going to break off and dig down into the de desert southwest and be our player for Sunday. So watch the progression here. It starts to dig down off the California coast and really take on a negative tilt as it moves into the desert southwest by Saturday into Sunday. Now notice the timing here already. This is this, this is Sunday afternoon. This is midday Sunday and the trough still lagging back a little bit out here across Arizona into New Mexico. So what does that mean? Well, as we know, when we have southwesterly flow traversing the Rockies, you get Lee cyclogenesis. A low level cyclone will develop on the east side of the Rockies somewhere in southeast Colorado, northeast New Mexico. That will be the case here, but it may only really start to ramp up that Lee cyclogenesis process around midday or so on Sunday. So that means that we may have a little bit of, perhaps a little bit of an issue getting the moisture up into this region with that somewhat delayed low level mass response. If we saw the edge of the forcing a little bit more out in here, we'd see surface low development much more, much sooner out here across Southeast Colorado. And therefore we'd have a little bit more time to get that moisture northward and start to modify that warm sector. Because of the timing here, we may have a little bit there's still a little bit of a question as far as when that will take place and, and if that will be enough to really advect that strong moisture in by the time this event gets underway. But again, because we have those 60s dew points, that r robust moisture, and that's not going to move a whole lot from southeast Texas, that's just kind of sitting there and will be somewhat easily pulled up once that low-level cyclogenesis, that low-level response begins. So we'll just have to wait and see. Uh, that's something at this range that we can't pinpoint exactly. But over the coming days, we should get a better idea of how, of when and how that moist, uh, that low level response will occur and help to pull that moisture northward. But in any case, very strong looking trough. This is about as classic of a look for severe weather in the central and southern plains as it gets. Very strong trough, compact, somewhat compact, strong trough ejecting into the plains. Takes on a little bit of a neutral or even negative tilt by 0Z Monday. So this is Sunday evening. And you'll see that the forcing by this time clearly within that target area. So we should have storm development sometime in the late afternoon hours on uh, Sunday, given the timing, at least with this particular model. So let's go ahead and stop it at 18Z. We'll look at the GFS 500 millibar map now. Same initializations looking good there. That cutoff starts to dig down into the desert southwest. Closed contours there. And this is 18Z Sunday. So let's see and compare it with the NAM run. GFS has a little bit more of a closed contour, maybe a little bit more of a negative tilt slightly earlier with this particular run, meaning that maybe the trough is overall a little bit more mature, but overall the idea is, is pretty much the same, trough in pretty much the same place between the name and GFS. Again, this is at midday on Sunday. Let's see what it has at 0Z. So this is 0Z NAM, pretty strong looking trough there. 0Z GFS. So just a, a slight change in maybe the overall orientation uh, and construction of the trough, a little bit more negatively tilted trough there with a closed contour across northern New Mexico as the NAM is more of an open wave. Still strong flow rounding the base of that trough and really shouldn't be too much of a difference as far as the impacts on severe weather between these two runs. Let's take a look at the Euro now. Once again, very good initialization. Cutoff low digs down across the California coast into the desert southwest. This is 18Z on Sunday, so midday Sunday. We'll compare the NAM, GFS, and the Euro. The Euro looks to be a, just slightly more progressive. You'll notice that the center of the trough, at least on the GFS back here across northwest Arizona um, on the Euro, 
little bit farther to the east. Not really uh, significant at this point, I don't think. May have just some slight implications on the timing of things. You'll notice that the forcing perhaps is ejecting a little bit sooner into the planes. That may be in a little bit earlier start to storm initiation versus the NAM and the GFS. But again, we're still three full days out from this event. So these we're going to see these little differences, and these will um, work themselves out over the coming days. But the Euro looks pretty good, pretty very similar to the other two models. We'll go to forward to zero Z here. And so this is the NAM, GFS, and the Euro. Euro, maybe just slightly more progressive, but still a very similar idea to the other two models. So what we do know, very strong trough here at 500 millibars, very favorable for severe weather, strong defluence aloft. We'll just take a quick peek at the 250 millibar map for that, and uh, you'll see fairly strong defluence aloft. Again, the defluence is the spreading apart of those wind vectors at the upper levels of the atmosphere, creates a void. Mother Nature doesn't like that, so tries to uh, compensate by bringing air up from below to help fill that void. So you'll see fairly strong defluence here across the region. Uh, wind barbs spreading apart there across this region. So large scale forcing for ascent, not going to be an issue with this particular system. And a very impressive look, very classic look for severe weather with this trough coming in um, on all three models. Let's take a look now at the surface response. Then we'll go back up to 850 millibars. So let's go back to um, our initialized model runs here. I'll reset back to the surface and we'll go here on the Euro. So, starting with the NAM, this is the 12Z initialization. You see that cold push, that colder air making its way down into the Northern Plains states, down into even Kansas and Oklahoma. Um, south of that cold front, you'll see our surface low up here in the Great Lakes vicinity with our cold front draped to the south. So, pretty good initializations there with the NAM. Now let's go forward in time. We'll start to see that cold front push southward just a little bit. We'll see that cold air get entrenched here over the next couple of days. But again, that moisture not going to be scoured too much over the next couple of days. So we'll see that cold front doesn't make a lot of, su of southward progression. You'll see that warm air stays there across southeast and south Texas. And then by Saturday, you'll notice here we still don't have a strong low-level response. Maybe some semblance of very slight surface low development as the outer fringes of that southwesterly flow starts to make their way across the Rockies. But notice we don't have any appreciable surface cyclogenesis until about midday on Sunday. You'll start to see those contours, those isobars start to really um, intensify and, and contract there across southeast Colorado. And this is, this is at 21Z, very strong surface low now in place. But notice that it only begins about late morning, midday on Sunday. So once again, that introduces a little bit of a question as far as moisture return goes and how soon that will start to, the, the winds will strengthen in the warm sector and back a little bit, pulling that moisture northward. Uh, once again, I'll keep mentioning it because we have, we're have we not going to sweep those dew points out well into the Gulf. It will be a little bit easier to get that moisture in place, especially across the Texas Panhandle into Oklahoma. Areas farther north may see a little bit of a struggle to get those more robust dew points, especially for parts of Kansas. But again, that is going to be worked out. The, the fine scale details with that are going to be worked out over the coming days. But strong surface low by 21Z across southeast Colorado, 0Z, very strong surface there along the Kansas Colorado border with very strong backed flow in the open warm sector. Let's look at the GFS. Same thing here. That cold front doesn't do a whole lot over the coming days. We go into Sunday. We do see some surface low development here on Sunday. That may start to help just ever so slightly bring those, strengthen and back those winds in the warm sector and start to just ever so slightly bring the, that moisture northward overnight Saturday into Sunday, but the real surface cyclogenesis is not going to take place until mid, about midday on Sunday. You'll see with the GFS, a little bit stronger response maybe with the surface load development there by midday Sunday. We go into, go towards zero Z, and you start to see that really consolidate there in Southeast Colorado, moving off into uh, Eastern Kansas by zero Z, cold front draped down there across the central te Texas Panhandle into the Texas South Plains. So that is going to be uh, we'll compare this with the NAM here. NAM is a little bit less progressive maybe with the surface low, but overall the the, the same idea. Surface low centered somewhere there in, in the Kansas-Colorado border region with cold front draped down to the south within that pressure tongue that goes through the Texas panhandle. Very similar setup here for and a, a pretty classic one for severe weather on the plains. Now let's go forward on the, on the Euro model. 
same thing here. A little bit of a surface low there developing in southeast Colorado Saturday afternoon into evening. But robust cyclogenesis there across eastern Colorado on uh, Sunday afternoon. A little bit different positioning maybe. Euro is maybe slightly farther north with the overall uh, center of the surface low. Maybe a little bit farther east with the cold front. You see the cold front is, is here in the eastern Texas panhandle, whereas with the other models, it's a little bit farther back here. This is the GFS, a little bit farther back here into the central Texas panhandle. So once again, some slight differences in the overall surface pattern here, uh, but those will be worked out over the coming days, as we uh, continue to say. Now let's look at dew points. Unfortunately, the European model does not have um, dew points on this particular model site, College of DuPage, but we can look at surface theta E that might help us. Again, theta E is simply a calculation of the energy of an air mass. It takes into account the temperature and the moisture co content of an air mass. So it's a decent measure of, quote unquote, the juiciness uh, of uh, a particular air mass. So we can look at that as a proxy for uh, low level uh, energy of the air mass. So let me actually zoom in down here to the Southern Plains sector. That might give us a little bit better view with these. And then we will take a look at the progression of the low level moisture. So this is the 12Z NAM. Notice that moisture is still sitting there across Southeast Texas. That cold front is right in this vicinity. And so over the coming days, it does move south a little bit, but you'll notice those dark blue colors, those upper mid to upper 60s dew points, don't go that far. They still stay across the southeast Texas coast into southeast Texas. And then we do see a little bit of a northward advance Saturday afternoon into Sunday evening as we do get a little surface low development up there in southeast Colorado on Saturday afternoon. That will continue into uh, Sunday. And you'll notice here between 12Z and 18Z, that moisture really starts to jump. Now at 12Z, our moisture, our 60s dew point still down in here. And for a typical severe weather event, you like to see them pretty much already in your target area the morning of the event. So this is going to be somewhat just in time moisture. And once again, this these details will work themselves out how strong and fast that surface low develops on Sunday to start pulling that moisture northward. But you can see when that surface low really starts to develop about 18Z really starts to pull that moisture northward. This is 21Z. This is 0Z on the NAM. Now, this is a pretty big outlier. This is where the models really start to diverge. Let's take a look at the GFS. GFS does the same thing, keeps those 60s dew points, doesn't quite scour them out as much into the Texas coast, still keeps those 60s dew points on land by Friday evening into Saturday. And you'll see we have a pretty good reservoir of 60s dew points up there, even by Saturday morning, um, just kind of sitting there across southeast and south Texas. Moving on, you'll notice by Sunday, by Saturday evening, those 60s dew points all the way up into northeast to central Texas. Much, much different. Let's compare that to where the NAM was on Saturday evening. You can see with the GFS that moisture is much farther north, much farther north. This is the, the stark difference between these models. The main difference between what the models are showing right now is this moisture return. GFS looks a little bit more favorable, a lot more favorable as far as moisture return goes. And I do have a hard time believing the NAM, especially at this range. It does have some issues with the moisture return. It does seem to be a little bit a um, little bit lagging with moisture return at these at this range uh, with the NAM. So perhaps a middle ground between the NAM and the GFS is in order. GFS here. Let's take a look at the Euro just to see how it's doing. Those reds and yellows are going to reds, oranges, and yellows are going to be your most juicy air. And so by zero Z Sunday, the moisture I don't think is going to be this far north. That might take into account those warmer temperatures up in here. But you'll see it's much, this, this plume of higher theta E air is much farther north here than what the NAM would show. I believe the NAM does have theta E here at the surface. And you can see that, that moisture is still way down south on the NAM if we look at theta E as opposed to the Euro, which is much, much farther north. So I have a tendency to believe the NAM is a little bit of an outlier in this situation. I think it's going to be one, as far as moisture return goes, that will throw out for the time being. And... I say that because we're going to have that cold that cold front's not going to sweep the dew points into the Gulf nearly as much as normal. And plus, we're going to have a very strong mass response with this particular system. Let's go on a little bit into um, the day on Sunday. So this is going to be at 18Z Sunday. Your 60s dew point's still way down to the south compared to the other two models. Let's go ahead and look at the GFS. 
Yeah, 18's a yard. You have 60's dew points up into Oklahoma there. So a very stark contrast between the two. European model may even be a little bit more robust with moisture return. And you can see, yeah, the stronger theta E air well up into Oklahoma by this point on Sunday. So I think given the strength of the mass response, very strong trough moving in in the upper levels, we should get a very strong surface low to develop out here across southeast Colorado. That will, in, that will initiate a very strong mass response across this region, strengthening and backing those winds in the low levels really efficiently and helping to pull that moisture northward, even though it's going to be just in time moisture, quote unquote, we will see a robust moisture return with this particular system. I, I just don't think that the NAM solution is believable given the strength of the low level response with this system. You never know, the NAM could end up being right. I just, from experience and from some past events, uh, some analogs, I just don't think that's going to be the case. I think we're going to be, we're going to have moisture up into this region. And even, at, we know at this time of the year, upper 50s dew points will get the job done with this particular event. You can, with these kinds of events, you can see 50s dew points up into western Oklahoma, the eastern Texas panhandle by 18Z on Sunday. This is at 0Z. Strong dry line taking shape, 50s, mid 50s dew points up well into Kansas. There's our dry line right in there, 60s dew points across Oklahoma. And this will definitely get it done. This might not be your classic, classic low-level moisture look for a, um, a, a, excuse me, April or May severe weather event. But for late February, this is going to definitely get the job done and does tends to do so with these off-season events. Let's look at the Euro at 0Z and very well-defined dry line there. Um, cold front will start to push through eventually but very strong dry line there across the eastern Texas panhandle. And uh, with the NAM, I'm just going to throw this out at this point. I think the moisture return is just a little bit on the late side with the NAM. I think this is a much more believable scenario uh, here looking at the GFS. So a quick look into the overnight hours. That dry line really starts to uh, sharpen there as we go just after sunset. And then eventually the cold front will push through for, as that surface low ejects off to the northeast pretty quickly as the trough moves in. Uh, we'll see that cold front push through. And by that time, we should see a more linear organization to the storms. But given this dry line here, fairly north-south oriented dry line across the eastern Texas panhandle, let's take a look at a... Um, our shear vectors with respect to the initiating boundary. And we see a decent amount of perpendicularity with respect to that initiating dry line, especially with northern extent. That dry line starts to sag back a little bit to the southwest. Shear vectors are a little bit more parallel to the boundary down there. But up here in the eastern Texas, in the eastern Texas panhandle, western Oklahoma, much better uh, look to the shear vectors up there. Um, a decent amount of perpendicularity. So would expect a window for discrete storms up in here. And with these events, you, we always have to look for discrete storms out ahead of the main init initiating boundary. We saw that in a couple of our analogs that we'll look at in just a few minutes. Uh, but these, this type of setup uh, does tend to initiate storms just out, out ahead of the main boundary, perhaps in that slightly better moisture, that 60s dew points. You could maybe even consider this a secondary moisture boundary, moisture gradient there. So we'll have to watch that for sure across southwest Oklahoma, perhaps. Uh, for some disc discrete supercell development out ahead, just ahead of the main dry line. But that, again, is a fine-scale detail that will be ironed out in the coming days. So that moisture again gets swept. The cold front will push through. We may have a continuation of the severe threat into Monday across parts of the southeast, but that cold front looks pretty progressive. That warm sector pinches off a little bit, and still some model discrepancies for Monday. So we'll have to watch that for sure. Uh, as we go into the next couple of days. But once again, the surface moisture, I'm going to lean towards this GFS and Euro solution for now, as I think that is a much more accurate depiction of the moisture than what the NAM is showing. So that's going to be our model comparison here. Overall, a very significant, very classic look to for a severe weather event in the central and southern plains. Just that main question about moisture return is going to be the issue. Let's take a couple of forecast soundings just before we go into some analogs here. I'll take one at, uh, uh, how about zero Z here across southwest Oklahoma. So Wichita Mountains vicinity there, just out ahead of the main dry line. Just to get an idea, and uh, again, don't stress too much about the overall thermodynamics. The global models especially tend to underdo the instability with these particular events. Now, interestingly enough, the GFS is quite capped here in the low levels, and that, I don't know if I tend to believe that. We should be fairly capped early in the day. You see that remnants, you see the remnants of the elevated mixed layer there aloft out across this region. If we take a sounding from the, um, let's say about midday, we should see that elevated mixed layer fairly entrenched into this region. 
Given the strength of this trough and the strength of the low level response, I do think we should see a pretty decent uh, erosion of that elevated mix layer. And yeah, you can see there with this midday sounding on Sunday, very strong elevated mix layer in place, very strong capping. But given the strength of the trough, low level, strong low level warm moist advection, I think that we shouldn't have too much of an issue eroding the cap. I think this may be a little bit of a GFS quirk as far as weaker instability and some capping issues there. Uh, so we'll have to watch that for sure, especially if temperatures get into the 70s. Again, these models, especially the NAM, but again, we're throwing out the NAM for now. These models tend to underdo surface temperatures just a little bit. So if we get into the low 70s, perhaps, um, given that strong, warm, moist advection at the surface, I don't think we'll have an issue eroding this cap. So going to disregard that for a second, but let's look at these wind profiles. About as favorable as it gets for supercells and tornadic supercells. Very strong, deep layer shear. Effective bulk shear of 66 knots there with very strong low level curvature, strong veering of those winds in the lowest levels of the atmosphere. Effective storm relative felicity over 350 meters squared per second squared. So a very favorable look for tornadic supercells if we can get uh, that, that uh, surface based nature to the storms, which I don't think is going to be too much of an issue. We'll have to watch this again over the coming days to see if this trend sticks around. But I, again, I don't think we're going to have too much of an issue eroding that cap given the strength of the forcing and the low-level warm advection. So very strong-looking profile there for tornadic supercells, perhaps some hail with these storms as well, given some moderate instability aloft uh, in that hail growth layer. Deep layer shear very strong for rotating strong updrafts. So large hail sh uh, should be a threat as well. And then eventually the storms will congeal into a line as that cold front pushes through overnight could see some uh, QLCS spin-ups and a damaging wind threat develop as that QLCS takes place, moves across central into eastern Oklahoma and uh, perhaps north central to northeast Texas. Those photographs, wow, as we go into the overnight hours, very, very favorable uh, as that low-level jet really ramps up there. Uh, so some QLCS circulations, embedded spin-ups within the line, definitely a threat across central Oklahoma, it looks like, if these model runs come to fruition. So this is a graphic here from the SIPS. This is uses some analogs, analog-based severe weather guidance. Gives us a probability for severe within 110 kilometers of a grid point. This is one of the more recent model runs, and you see they have a similar look to the SPC. A little bit farther west, though, and that is a trend that tends to happen with these events. The models, so these trough ejections tend to slow down just a tad from what the models are showing. So I would not be surprised to see this area shift back a little bit toward the west. We see this enhanced to come more into the Texas Panhandle and have this portion of the eastern Texas Panhandle a little, a little bit more under the gun um, over the next few outlooks. But we'll have to wait and see as far as that goes. But you can see, based on some historical analogs, severe weather is a likelihood with these type of events. Let's go into some specific analogs. The first one that came to mind for me was November 16th, 2015. This was... Um, a, an off-season, obviously a, a cold season outbreak across the central to southern plains. Enhanced risk here. And just to go back to our point about shifting, uh, the, these threats shifting, the day four outlook, this was our day four outlook right here across central Texas into southern Oklahoma. And by day one, we had that slight risk all the way into the central Texas panhandle. Enhanced risk out here well to the west and northwest of what initially was showing. That trough slowed down a little bit. And we got a pretty significant tornado outbreak across the northern Texas Panhandle in southwest Kansas from some discrete supercells here with that particular event. Let's look at some data, and you'll see that some similarities right away in this particular event. This is 500 millibars, very strong trough, somewhat of a cutoff, closed circulation there. This is at 0Z on uh, from the evening of November 16th, 2015. Strong trough there centered across the Four Corners region. Strong flow rounding the base of that trough. Strong upper defluence as well. So um, all in all, a very similar look to what we were seeing. Let me go to the GFS solution at 500 millibars here and back out just a tad to the Conus sector. And so this is 0Z, very similar look. You can see that the GFS, the models are showing a little bit more maybe of a negative tilt to the, our upcoming events trough, but overall a very similar look here with these two events at 500 millibars. Um, so this is something, this is upper, upper pattern, something we've certainly seen before with these uh, some of these off-season events, uh, significant events at that. We'll go down to 850 millibars here. Let me go back to our OBS. Go down to 850 
and you'll see at the start of the day, not really a well-defined circulation here in the low levels. We, it, we waited a little bit to really see that low-level jet and low-level response take place, but by late afternoon, early evening, it's very strong low-level jet in place across this region, Consoli very, cons very strong consolidation in those 850 millibar height contours there. Very similar to what we're seeing with this particular event. A little bit later, low-level response given the timing of the ejection of the trough. And that may uh, have some impacts on the overall timing with our November 16th event, our 2015 event. Storms didn't really get going until right at, at about sunset to just after dark there. But you'll notice here with our upcoming event, and this is the GFS, that low-level jet doesn't really start to ramp up until the late afternoon to early evening hours there um, across the southern plains and very similar look here with our November 15th, uh, 2015 event. Surface pattern going to be similar as well. Let's pull that up. Once again, the surface low starts to really take shape there by about, by about midday or so, and very elongated surface low there across the region. Um, similar to what we're seeing with this particular event, maybe a little bit farther south and southwest of our upcoming event, but again, that could change over the coming days. Overall, very similar looking event. We'll go to our radar here, and once again, notice that we have some discrete supercells firing well ahead of our main line that's getting its act together here, Western Texas Panhandle up into Southeast Colorado and Western Kansas. Numerous discrete supercells well ahead of the line, given that strong forcing, fairly uncapped warm sector there um, for supercells. So that'll be something to watch, and is somewhat of a hallmark with these events. Happens just happens quite a bit out here in these events and if we look at our surface observations you'll notice at 20 we'll go to zero z here our cold front our main boundary is somewhere back in here you see the wind shift there storms the discrete storms fire just ahead of that that dry line slash cold front pacific front whatever you want to call it so definitely going to have to watch that in our sunday event as that is somewhat of a hallmark as i said with these types of events another uh analog that comes to mind march 28th 2007 had a large moderate risk with a broad area of tornado threat uh, from all the way up into Nebraska down to South Texas. Now, not quite as widespread of a risk for our Sunday event, but a very similar look to the overall upper pattern. This is 12Z, this is 0Z. Very similar pattern to our November 5th, 2015 event and our upcoming event. A little bit more positive tilt to this trough, but again, the overall idea is the same. Trough center near the four corners and strong flow rounding the base of that trough, strong uh, divergence aloft there in the upper levels of the atmosphere. And we go to 850. This one had a little bit more of a low level jet in place early on, but still very similar look. Elongated low level jet swat there across the panhandle of Texas up to the north into Kansas. And our surface pattern, uh, surface obs, uh, we can look and see our uh, surface low. Surface low gonna be somewhere uh, up in northeast Colorado, somewhere in that vicinity with a cold front draped down to the south, cold front slash dry line, and storms fired out ahead of the main boundary. Here's our radar. So our cold front is somewhere back in here, and notice where our storms, our initial discrete supercells fire. Central Texas Panhandle to Texas South Plains, a little bit ahead of the main boundary. And so again, that's gonna be something we're, we're, we'll have to watch very closely uh, as you see that the supercells that produced multiple tornadoes there across the Texas Panhandle, main line be well behind that. So definitely going to have to watch that as for our Sunday event for sure. Uh, so that's going to wrap things up for this forecast discussion. I'll be back with another discussion likely uh, Sunday morning, uh, the morning of this particular event. Uh, but this looks like a potentially significant event for the planes. Would not uh, again don't really don't take these uh, boundaries, these outlines. Uh, with full reality yet. These are, could easily shift. The main thing we, things we know right now is that a, a severe weather event, potentially a significant one, is in the forecast for these areas. So if you're in or even near these areas, Texas Panhandle, to Western to Central Texas Panhandle, down to, to Lubbock, Midland, keep in mind that these outlines will change over the coming days. But right now we have an enhanced risk, 30% region, from Southern Kansas into uh, Western and Central Oklahoma. Uh, with a large slight risk surrounding that. So the potential is there for a significant severe weather event with all hazards likely, perhaps initial discrete supercells firing along the dry line, maybe just ahead of the dry line there across 
far, the far southeast Texas panhandle into southwest Oklahoma, looking like the most likely area at this point. Again, that could shift back west a little bit. And then storms will congeal into a line as we move on uh, into the evening hours as that cold front pushes in. One final note, just quickly on the uh, November 2015 event, the uh, a very similar, uh, very similar uh, evolution was forecast. Uh, if you you'll notice here, the convection should evolve into a linear MCS by the evening. Um, initial storms will be discrete. Um, and if we go here into uh, the 1630 outlook, model guidance remains suggestive that a fairly rapid transition to a QLCS will occur this evening. So uh, just as we saw in this event, and we'll go down to the text here, um, a rapid transition to a linear mode is expected as the system pushes east and northeast across Oklahoma and Kansas. So in both cases, there was a forecast for a pretty rapid transition to a linear organization to the storms. But in both cases, in both cases, the March 28th, 2007 event and the November 16th, 2015 event, we had uh, several hours of discrete convection a little bit out ahead of the main boundary. So that'll be something we have to watch for, especially right now. It looks like the most likely area for that is going to be across so the southeast Texas panhandle in the southwest Oklahoma. But again, that could change, shift a little bit farther back west. I do have a sneaking susp suspicion we may see the lines a little bit shifted west by the time the uh, event comes, as that is usually the case with these types of of events, but we'll have to see as we go into the coming days and we get some more data in. So that's going to do it for now. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next video.